Hey everybody, it's time for another Transport Evolve staff car update. So, welcome to Glyph, my and my husband's 2018 Tesla Model 3 long range rear wheel drive. We bought this car used about probably seven or eight months ago now, and I want to talk a little bit about how we like it, what's worked for us, some of the issues we've had, uh, and what you can sort of expect if you're looking at a used Tesla Model 3. So, bit of background about how we ended up with this car. Quite a bit ago, my husband and I bought a Hyundai Kona EV, a 2019 Hyundai Kona EV, and we really quite liked it. The Kona EV is a fantastic car. It really met all of our needs. It was sort of what we we're looking for at the time. Uh, the DC fast charging wasn't as fast as I would have liked, but otherwise it was quite fantastic. But as you probably know, if you follow Transport Evolved, the Kona EV developed a small problem with its batteries exploding. And when that problem was first uh, identified, Hyundai released a software update that limited the DC fast charge speed and the maximum range of the car in order to try to keep them from exploding. We now know that actually didn't work, and now Hyundai is going to be replacing the main traction batteries in all the Kona EVs on the market. But at the time, we were told that was the final fix, and we were pretty concerned about it. We were making payments on the car, and now we had a car which had been digitally hampered from what we'd originally bought. And we went to Hyundai and said, hey, is there going to be more done about this problem? And we were told there was not, that that was the final resolution. And we said, okay, could we maybe get our battery replaced? And they said no battery replacements were going to be an option. So at that point, we said, okay, well, this is not the car we bought. We had chosen the Kona over, for instance, the Chevy Bolt, in part because it had the 76 kilowatt DC quick charging, uh, and we liked the maximum range that it had. And uh, Hyundai looked at our state, uh, we were living in Maine at the time, we still are, but aren't for much longer, looked at our state lemon laws and said, you've got 15,000 miles on the car, you've had it about 15 months, uh, you're still within the lemon law limit, and in the end they bought the car back. And we weren't sure what we were going to do when they bought the car back. Uh, we really liked the Kona, there weren't a ton of options. We sort of thought about maybe going for a, a Kia, Kia Nero, which is a very good car. But then we saw this. Uh, this car belonged to the owner of an EV sales and service place about an hour and a half north of where we live in Maine, really out in the middle of nowhere. And this had been the owner's personal car. We actually bought our first plug-in car from them, our, our, our used Chevy Volt we had gotten there. Um, so the owner had this car, he had bought it when it first came out, it was actually one of, if not the first, Model 3s in the state of Maine, and he had decided to buy a used uh, Model S, because he wanted something bigger, and he was putting this car up for sale for a very, very, very aggressive price. When we bought this car, it was actually the cheapest Model 3 that we could find in the United States that had a clean title, this wasn't a salvage title car. But basically what he said was, you know, it's not going to be easy to sell it um, in rural Maine. He was going to send it to an auto auction, and he basically put up for sale for a week for what he was going to get for it when he sent it to the auto auction. And it so happened that what we had gotten back for the Kona was very close to what he was asking for this car, with about 27,000 miles on the clock, um, and still a, a fair bit of manufacturer warranty left. And... Um, we had not really seriously thought about Tesla. Um, both my husband and I have some issues with how the company does things, particularly living in Maine. We didn't like the idea of the nearest service center being three states away. Um, we don't like Tesla's sort of attitudes on right to repair, but we thought it was really worth taking a look at the car. So I went up, I drove the car. Um, I quite liked it, but it was going to be my husband's car primarily, and he was very sort of on the fence. But we went up so he could drive it, and uh, I think he got about a mile down the road on his test drive of this car when he looked at me and said, yeah, we're not going back because uh, I'm having fun, but when we get back to the dealership, we are absolutely buying this car. He just fell in love with it immediately because um, it just is such a good car to drive. 
I really think of the Model 3 very much as a performance sedan, in the same vein as, for instance, a BMW M car. I think everyone knows that Teslas are quick. Uh, Teslas never built a car that wasn't quick. And actually, I sometimes get uh, a bit of guff from people uh, in the Tesla community about the fact that we have, you know, the slow Tesla. Um, in 2018, the long range, its 0 to 60 time was, was I believe, just around 6 seconds. Um, which, for an EV, doesn't sound all that fast. But, by sort of the standards of, of cars through my lifetime, that's still blisteringly quick. When you put the pedal down in this car, it still sort of tosses your head back. And I'll admit, like, I don't do full pedal to the floor accelerating this car very often because it honestly makes me kind of uncomfortable. Not from a safety standpoint, but from a, like, physicality standpoint. I have kind of a messed up neck um, and, you know, I feel it when this car really, really goes. But what I think doesn't get talked about quite as often is that this car also really corners and holds a line beautifully. And that's sort of impressive when you think about the fact that this car is unbelievably heavy, sort of by sedan standards, because you are a whole battery pack. You feel the weight in this car. You never, at no point driving this car, do you really feel like you're driving a Miata. You just don't. You feel the weight in this car, but it handles it extremely well. You know, the brakes do a fantastic job, though we rarely use them because of one pedal driving. When you, when you hit a corner, you point the nose where you want it to go, and the car just goes there, and it feels great. From a comfort standpoint, that's where you get the trade-off. Is it the most comfortable riding car I've ever been in? Eh, not by a long shot. Um, you very much sort of feel that you're in a bit of a performance sedan, and you're paying some of the comfort penalties for being in a performance sedan. But it's it's a fine trade-off in my mind. And it's still a car that I'm happy to do a road trip with. The longest trip I've done with this car so far is about, uh, about a thousand miles round trip, which I did in about uh, two days. And uh, and it was it was quite good for it. Um, my standards are all weird. I once did a similar trip in a in a 1972 VW Beetle, and it was not as good. The seats are reasonably comfortable, not nearly as much so as I'd expected. They're very adjustable, which I really appreciate. But are they better than my 2017 Chevy Bolt? Yes. So's a lawn chair. Are they much, much better than my 2017 Chevy Bolt? No. Kind of wish they were. Other big factors in sort of driving and owning this car, I mean, obviously, you're going to have to talk about the interface. Um, this car is quite different in how you interact with and control it. For starters, pretty much everything happens through this giant touchscreen that you have in, in the middle of the dash. Um, and you don't have a traditional binnacle or gauge cluster right in front of the driver, which is actually something that I don't mind. I absolutely think this car would benefit from a heads-up display. And Elon Musk has been asked about that quite a lot. And Elon says this car doesn't have a heads-up display because when push comes to shove, it's not meant to be driven by a driver. It's meant to be mostly operating autonomously. That's very aspirational and doesn't fit with the actual use case of most owners, or really any owners at the moment. I really expected that I would hate having to do everything through the center screen, and I don't. I don't like looking away from the road, I don't like digging in menus, but the reality is that these days, and I know this has changed as the software is updated, we actually had a major software refresh not long after we bought the car. I can get to almost everything that I want pretty easily without having to dig. Um, and the things that are a little harder to get to, the car's voice recognition works really, really well for. So for instance, living in the country uh, where there's very few streetlights, I often want the screen to be very dim. Uh, but then there are other times, you know, if I get onto the highway where I might want it brighter. Adjusting the screen brightness while you're driving is frankly not the safest thing in the world. You know, compared to, for instance, my Chevy Bolt, where there's just a little knob. 
and you just you just turn the knob and where you turn the knob determines how you know bright the screen is in this car you have to go through some menus but on the other hand you can just tell it what you want so i just press the little button on the steering wheel to get voice recognition and i tell it how bright i want the screen to be just in words and it does it and that's really nice other things when it comes to sort of the interface there is a gear selector in this car, it's on the stock. It is very simple and easy to use. There is no power button in this car. You get in the car, the car is basically awake, you put your foot on the brake, the whole car comes to life. That's it. Um, if you need to shut the car off, you can. You can go into the menu and there's an option to just physically shut down the car, but you very, very, very rarely would need to do that. I'm pretty used to that now. Like, I like it. In a modern car, you don't really need a power button. I never have felt like it was something that I wanted in this car. When I get into my car, because um, I said this is my husband's, when I get into my Bolt, sometimes I, I find myself like, wait, why is nothing happen? Oh, right, I have to push the button. And then you feel silly, like, why do I have to push the button? You know I'm in the car. The other controls, you've got these uh, wheels on the steering wheel, which are buttons, scroll wheels, and they rock from side to side. Uh, it's a very, very, very simple steering wheel. It's not busy at all in a way that um, I've actually come to really like. I also love that uh, it doesn't have a lot of lights and what lights it has, I can turn off. Because as I said, I live in the country where it's dark, really hate a lot of bright, distracting lights. I had a Mazda 3 uh, 2012 and it had like 20 some odd buttons on the steering wheel. And I really like the simplicity of the interface on the Tesla by comparison. Um, I've never felt like I wanted to do something on my steering wheel that I couldn't do. I worry about the longevity of these little jog slash scroll wheels, um, but I haven't had any problems with them. Other things on sort of the, the comfort and convenience front, uh, the car is extremely customizable. So for instance, setting the mirrors on this car, the side view mirrors, is a pain in the rear end. You have to go into a menu, you've got to select which mirror you want to adjust, then you adjust the mirror from the controls on the steering wheel, <clears throat> then you select the other mirror, you adjust that mirror. It's, it's a pain, but you only have to do it once because the car has uh, really comprehensive driver profiles that include your steering wheel position, your side view mirror position, it includes where you have your heating and, and HVAC stuff set, what driving modes you have set up. So for instance, in this car, you can change from one pedal driving to low regenerative braking. You can switch between comfort, normal, and sport uh, resistance on the steering wheel. You can decide if you want the car to roll when you ease off the brake, or if you want the car to hold its position when you ease off the brake but so that um, when you come to a stop and take your foot off the brake, the car continues to keep the brake applied and the brake lights on. You can set all of that under your driver profile. And that's what we did. My husband has his profile, I have my profile, I get in the car, I tap the button, the seat position, everything adjusts to just the way I like it. Um, and that's a big sort of counterfactor to the fact that it's a pain in the butt to do some things in the car, such as adjust the mirrors of the steering wheel. The fact that I don't have to do that, you know, every time I get in the car, makes up for the fact that it's a little bit, maybe a little more awkward to do. Um, speaking of those settings, by the way, uh, I keep the car in hold all the time. Um, so I come to a stop, tap the brake, the car puts on the brake lights and the brakes hold until the accelerator pedal is pressed. My husband doesn't like that. He likes roll. Um, I went from driving manual transmission cars to driving EVs with one pedal driving. He went from manual transmission cars to automatic transmission cars in the form of our, our old Prius and then Ford C-Max um, and then to EVs and he's much more comfortable with roll than I am. I'm, I'm very happy with hold. It's one of the things I really wish the Bolt had, was that when I came to a stop, I could take my foot off the brake and have the car stay where it is. Now, let's talk about autopilot for a minute. Uh, this car does not have uh, FSD or FSD beta. It does have uh, enhanced autopilot. Uh, at the time this car was bought, uh, autopilot was an option. 
And it's an option that did come with the car, I think because the option in that case was actually a physical computer that was built into the car. I quite like Tesla Autopilot. I did a whole video recently on Autopilot looking at what it is, how it works, and whether or not we feel the name Autopilot is, is all that appropriate. And I'll link to that in the description below. Um, but I really like it. As a workload reducer, it's, it's fantastic. It's not the first car we've had that had good lane centering or good adaptive cruise control. Um, but it does a it does a really nice job. And I should note, uh, as far as I know, I have been driving this car with camera, ultrasonic sensor, and radar-based autopilot. I believe Tesla's going to be disabling the radar in older uh, Model 3s, and Tesla is no longer installing radar in Model 3 and Model Y that are being produced now. Um, I can't really speak to that, because I said, as far as I know, I've been using radar and camera-based, but I could be wrong. Tesla's not the most transparent about these things. Autopilot does a very good job of holding its place in the road. Uh, people say that you need to have lane markings. Uh, we sort of do. If you have a center lane marking and a high contrast shoulder, say uh, black tarmac and sand, uh, Autopilot will lock on just fine. It doesn't need a, a painted marking there. The places where Autopilot sort of struggles a little bit is that its lane centering is very literal. It wants to be in the center of the lane. And that means that, for instance, if you're on the highway in the right lane and an on-ramp merges in and the lane widens to allow for zipper merging, um, the car will try to go to the center of that, you know, new absurdly wide lane. It's not Autopilot's fault, it's how it's written and it makes sense. So I think you have to be very alert about. Um, it also struggles if you're in like a single lane road that becomes like a turn lane and a straight lane. Autopilot doesn't really know what to do a lot of the time about which lane it wants to be in. Um, you do have to remain sort of alert. Um, Autopilot doesn't do a lot of auto steering evasion stuff. It's got a brake. That's its evasion. Um, so someone drifts over the center line into your path of travel, you need to be ready to yank the wheel. And I've had that happen where I really feel like if I had let the car sort of continue controlling itself, we could have been in an accident. What I said in my video, and I really stand by, is that 90% of the time autopilot does a fantastic job, and then 10% of the time it's absolute junk. Um, I think that's, on the balance, a really good ratio for a driver assist feature. Um, but you do have to be ready at all times to assume control. I actually feel like Autopilot makes me a bit of a safer driver because I have a little bit more attention for what's going on around me. Um, at the same time, I have occasionally found myself falling into sort of the thought pattern of feeling more like a passenger than a driver. And that's very dangerous. And I, I try to be really self-aware that if I find myself feeling that way, I disable autopilot and I resume full, you know, manual control. Um, just because I think that form of complacency is really dangerous uh, when you're using a system which is just not intended to be uh, autonomous. It's designed to be a driver aid. So yeah, I like autopilot. I haven't used full self-driving beta. Um, I'm interested to try it. I think FSD is going to be very good. The videos I've seen of people using it, it looks very good. I think the idea that these cars are going to drive themselves without any humans in the car at all, such as as a robo taxi that would go off and pick someone up and take them where they're going, um, you know, on its own. I know a lot of people feel that we are just a couple of months away from that, but people who've been in the Tesla world for a long time have told me that we've been a couple of months away from that for a long time. And I think we're still a long way away from that sort of functionality. I could be wrong. Um, I absolutely could be. Um, it'd be cool to be wrong. Uh, I think the idea of, of the car being able to do that is really neat. Also, uh, I think the idea of the subscription service for FSD is really interesting. Um, you know, if we could, we don't need FSD in our daily life, not for 10 grand. Um, which is, you know, like a decent chunk of what we paid for this car. Um, but, you know, to drive from Maine to Oregon, it would sure be nice to have. We could get it, rent it for like that month. I would really think about it. So I'll be interested to see where that goes. As I said, 
we've had this car in Maine. That's where we've been living for the last 11 years. We are in the process of moving out to Oregon to be closer to the rest of the Transport Evolve team. Uh, and we, in fact, will be driving this car cross country. We'll uh, probably be shipping my Bolt. Um, but we're going to take uh, Glyph on the cross country drive from Maine to Oregon. And that's going to be an adventure. But because we've been living in Maine, we have a, quite a bit of experience driving this car in the winter time. And I want to talk about that for a sec. Because when I tell people that we have a rear wheel drive car, um, people sort of in the know with Tesla tend to say, well, you messed up there. You really need the all wheel drive if you're going to live in New England. Um, and people who don't know EVs at all really sort of turn white and say, how could you possibly drive a rear wheel drive car in the winter time? So uh, let's get this out of the way. We've owned four EVs. We owned an i3, a Hyundai Kona, a Chevy Bolt, and a Tesla Model 3. And two of those cars were rear wheel drive. Two of those cars were front wheel drive. And I'm going to say that if I have my choice between front and rear wheel drive in an electric vehicle, I'm going to choose rear wheel drive every time. The idea that front wheel drive vehicles are better in snow comes from the fact that most cars keep their engines up front and having the weight over the drive wheels increases your traction. But of course, most of this car's weight is the entire floor. That's sort of the standard EV thing. So that stops being as big a factor. Um, and in fact, the motor for this car is in the rear where the drive wheels are. With modern traction control in particular, um, but mostly with the layout of an EV. We have found that rear-wheel drive in the snow has been very, very, very good on both our i3 and this car. Um, keep in mind that, like, my antique VW Beetles did great in the snow. They were rear-engine and rear-wheel drive, so you still have the weight over the, over the drive wheels. The big thing to me, the reason why I have a preference, is that when you put the pedal down in this car, it goes forward really well. When you put the pedal down in the Bolt or the Kona, the front end gets squirrely because of torque steer. So torque steer is caused by having uneven length drive shafts, which is a common thing in, in front, uh, front wheel drive cars. Uh, this car has really no torque steer, um, or at least very, 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 very little. And that adds to my level of confidence in the winter time. And I've driven this car in some really bad weather over this last winter. Now, with that said, the tires this car had when we bought it were not suitable for the snow. We put Nokian Huckapleda R3 studless snow tires on this car for the winter. Didn't really hit our range very much. Didn't hit really our, our handling characters as much at all. And greatly increased our winter performance in terms of uh, snow and wet conditions. Um, and this is a car I feel really, really confident in, in bad weather. As far as the winter goes, handling wise, really fantastic. Range wise, this car takes a pretty hard hit. Uh, this car has a resistive heater, not a heat pump, which certainly contributes to range loss in the winter time. But you know, it starts out with such a big range anyway, it's not a huge deal. And you do lose efficiency. Um, some of that snow tires, some of that's, you know, if you're riding in snow, you're working extra hard to push through the snow. So if we're going to talk about range, let's talk about charging. Charging on this car has been the biggest sort of revelation in the ownership experience. As I said, very much not our first EV. We had the Kona, we've got a Bolt, we had a BMW i3, um, we had a Chevy Volt. This car, I won't say that it's ruined me for other brands, because that's not true. Um, I'm very open to the idea of other brands of EVs. But it has kind of ruined me for other charging sort of experiences to some extent. All the other cars we've had were 50-ish um, kilowatt charging, except for the, the Kona, which was technically 76 kilowatts, but you only got it in really ideal conditions. Um, in the winter time, we saw very low charge speeds out of the Kona, even on like hard highway driving. I've charged this car significantly in excess of 200 kilowatts. And 
there's a few reasons why this car charges so well. First and foremost, it just, it's got a big battery and it's designed to accept really high rates of charging. Um, but that's not the whole picture. The other big thing in this car is that when this car knows that you're going to a DC fast charger, that can happen if you map to a DC fast charger, or if you're navigating and driving and the car knows that it's going to need to charge, it will automatically include fast charging stops in its route planning. And when you're about 20 minutes away from a charger, um, if it feels that the battery is not in an ideal state for taking a charge, the car will automatically begin preparing the battery. In the wintertime, that means that the car will start heating up the battery pack to get it ready to be the optimal temperature for taking a fast charge. And that means that even when I've driven this car on long trips in, you know, January or February, I could still plug in and get a consistent 125 or 175 or 200 kilowatts. Um, all depends on what generation supercharger you're connecting to. At a V2 supercharger, I consistently can draw 125 kilowatts for an extended period of time. At a V3 supercharger, I've pulled, I think the highest I've ever seen out of this car was 215. Um, and it didn't pull 215 for that, that, that long, but it didn't ramp down really hard either. It sort of went, you know, 215, 200, and then held at 175 for a long time. Um, what that means in practice is that unlike when I road tripped with the Kona, for instance, or the Bolt, where a charging stop, you want to think about what am I going to do during my charging stop? Do I want to take a nap? Do I want to read a book? Do I want to go in and get lunch? This car's charging stops are much more sort of, I'm going to run in and use the bathroom, grab a bottle of water, and when I tie it back to the car, I'm going to be good to go to the next charging stop. We mapped from uh, using Tesla's website has a route planner where you enter what car you have and we did the maps last night from Maine to Oregon. It's going to be a long trip and charging is going to add to that time but the longest charging stop, the longest that the car or rather Tesla planned out for us is 40 minutes, 4-0. That's the longest charging stop that I saw. Most of them are 10 minutes, 12 minutes, 15 minutes. Now granted, you're doing that relatively frequently. You do, you know, 15 minutes, drive for an hour and a half, do another 10 minutes, what have you. Um, but you can pack a lot of power in in that time, and that is really remarkable. Um, we were talking last night about what other EVs that are coming out now that we look at that, that would really interest us. And uh, honestly, the Ionic 5 is really high on that list because it looks amazing. Um, but also because it's got that 800 volt architecture and can charge it in excess of 300 kilowatts. And just having had this car, we're not in a place where we would be willing to go back to having two cars, for instance, that charged at 55 kilowatts. We just wouldn't. Um, this car has absolutely ruined us. To us, having a long range EV means fast charging, real properly quick charging. Um, more so even than it means sort of range and battery capacity. Although battery capacity and charging speed are, are quite linked. So I talked about DC fast charging, but I should probably talk about uh, level two charging as well. Because of course, like the overwhelming majority of EV drivers, we almost always are charging our cars at home. Um, we have a dual connector EVSE from Clipper Creek. That way we can plug both our cars in at once. And because we rent, we specifically chose the model that plugs into a NEMA 14-50 plug. And because this is a Tesla, we have to use an adapter. The uh, EVSE is a J1772. So we have the uh, J1772 to Tesla adapter that of course comes with the car. Um, and we have never had an issue with it. Um, it charges very, very, um, very well through that. It's, is it a little annoying to have the adapter? Only in so much that the adapter's proportions don't really work with a Tesla holster. Um, and of course I can't put the, uh, J1772 connector with the adapter into a J1772 holster. On the scheme of annoyances, 
that is so low that it's just not an issue. Um, Owen normally leaves the uh, adapter on his connector. Sometimes he'll take it off and just put it in the cup holder of the car, um, but it's not been an issue at all. I really was worried initially that, like, was it going to be awkward not having an actual Tesla connector? And it's really not. Um, so, for instance, the charging cord locks in place, like most cars. The bolt doesn't, which annoys me. Um, but just as you'd push the button on a, on a Tesla connector, um, if you push the release button on the J1772 as if you were going to take it off of the adapter, the adapter tells the car to unlock the charging port. So you just tap that real quick, let it relock, pull it off. Super, super convenient. Really well thought out. So outside of the, uh, the interface, there are some other sort of convenience features that are worth talking about. Um, one of the big ones is the phone key. Uh, this is the first car I've ever used that had a phone key, and I didn't know until I started watching reviews for some other vehicles that not all manufacturers have sort of nailed the phone key experience, um, because it just works on this car so well. Um, I've never not had the phone key work. Um, sometimes when I want to get into the car, if I have my phone in my back pocket, the signal doesn't sort of make it through all my fleshy parts, and I have to turn my butt a little bit to align my phone more with the car, but that's not a problem with uh, the car or the phone key. That's such a problem with my fat butt. It is remarkably convenient and sort of fits with the whole way Tesla handles things. Tesla is very focused on simplifying. Sometimes I think that goes to excess, um, and I sometimes I don't think that's entirely about the driver experience, and that's about making cars as cheaply and profitably as possible. But in addition to the phone key, you have RFID key cards for this car. You don't have any conventional metal keys. And the RFID key cards are super convenient and cheap. When we bought this car, it had one key, and we immediately set up our phones, but still, we had one key, which is not enough in my mind. Um, so I went onto Tesla's website and ordered uh, more key cards. Um, you buy them in packs of two. I think it cost me like $20. When I bought my Chevy Bolt EV, it had one key, and one key is not enough. So I had to buy another. And for that car, it cost me $125 to buy the key and $90 to program the key. This car, it was 20 bucks for two keys, and I programmed them myself in about five minutes. And that is really nice. I'll admit, as someone who can be at times a bit Luddite-ish, uh, I was very nervous about the whole, like, no proper key thing. And I rarely see it discussed of how Tesla addressed that. Am I saying that Tesla's solution is the best? No, but let's talk about what, what they did. So if you kill your 12 volt battery in this car, you can't get in. That just makes sense. Um, in like the bolt, there's a, a metal key that's sort of hidden in the, in the key fob. Um, and if you know where to remove the little panel on the door handle, you can get into the car. Not so on this car. Um, what there is on this car is that on the front of the car, there is the panel that covers where you would screw in an eye bolt for like tying the car down, um, like on a, on a truck. And behind there are two wires. And those two wires, if you connect them to a battery, all it does is actuate the solenoid for the frunk hood. The frunk hood pops up, and once the frunk is open, you can access where the 12 volt battery is, and then you can jump the 12 volt or replace it. That powers up the car and will let you get in. I have never done that. Um, I don't think I've even spoken to someone who's done that, um, but that's the idea. And the car, from what I understand, is very good about warning you when your 12 volt is going bad. Um, as with any electric vehicle, when the 12 volt is going bad, you absolutely need to deal with it because EVs, they don't cope well with failing 12 volts. You end up with all sorts of problems with a bad 12 volt in terms of 
you know, warnings and, and weird malfunctions. A lot of stuff that can go wrong in an EV that can just be addressed by replacing a sour 12 volt battery. Just sort of, that's not a Tesla thing, that's an all EV thing. And we've done a whole video on why electric vehicles still have 12 volt batteries, and I'll link to that in the description below. Another convenience feature that I really appreciate on this car is it has auto dimming side view mirrors as well as an auto dimming rear view mirror. Now, I've owned plenty of cars with auto dimming rear view mirrors, but this is the first time I've owned a car with auto dimming side view mirrors, and it's really nice. Uh, some of that is that, as we talked about earlier, it's a lot harder to adjust your side view mirrors in this car. So if you've got a, a car coming up on the side with bright headlights, it's in the mirror reflecting your eyes, you'd have to dig into some screens and menus and do some stuff to adjust the side view mirror. So instead you get the auto dimming ones, but as a convenience feature, it's really nice. Uh, is it something I would have to have in a future car? No, I, I you know, it's one of those things you can live without, but it's awfully nice to have. I mentioned that uh, we tend to be hatchback people, not sedan people, um, but it's worth noting that this car holds a lot of stuff. It's a very spacious trunk. I mean, really fabulously spacious trunk. Um, and you can put the seats down and you have the frunk. And because it's a rear wheel drive model, our frunk is actually pretty darn spacious too. Um, it's not as convenient as a hatchback. You can't fit as big things in it as you can with a hatchback. Um, if I have to pack a vehicle, I'd still rather pack a Bolt than pack this. But goodness, uh, you know, there's lots of storage. Likewise, the rear seats in this car are very comfortable and quite roomy. Uh, when it comes to space, Tesla has done a fantastic job of, of utilizing the space and really maximizing the advantages of having an EV. I also want to talk for a sec about the infotainment. So, as I said, everything in this car goes through this big center screen and you don't get in this car, you don't get access to Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. And I'll admit I miss that um, in when I'm driving this car compared to other cars because you can't do everything. People told me before we bought this car, like anything you can do in Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, you can, you can do in this car. And it's not true. Um, you can do a lot. Of cars I've owned that didn't have access to Android Auto or Apple CarPlay, this car does a better job of managing uh, infotainment and access to stuff that's on my phone than any other car. Um, but it's not great. It's not perfect. Um, for instance, at work, we use Telegram to communicate quite a bit. And if I'm driving in the Bolt and my phone's connected and I'm using Apple CarPlay and a message comes in on Telegram, I can just tap the screen and it will read me that message. And if I want to respond, I can just tap again and I can say what I want to say with my mouth. It gets transcribed by the car and sent to our telegram chat. This car, I can't do that. I get, as I'm driving, I'll get the little plunk sound that lets me know that I've got a telegram message, but I have no way to read it or listen to it or whatever. And that's annoying. I can only use Tesla's navigation and mapping system on this car, though it is kept up to date and is very, very good. Living in the country, Mm, sometimes things change and it's not made aware of them, but you can even get that with Google Maps and Apple Maps, so it's hard to really complain. I can't control my podcast player um, on here uh, or my audiobooks nearly uh, as well as I can on my phone, and that's annoying, but it's livable. Um, I can play on music and stuff. Now, my husband he uses Spotify for everything, and this car has Spotify built in. We pay for connectivity package for this car, um, so he can stream Spotify right to the car. He just has it connected to his Spotify account. Um, so for him, it's not as big a deal, but it's not. I'm not the primary driver of the car, so it's not set up for me that way. I think as I've made it clear, we really, really, really like this car. It's, it's absolutely fantastic, but it's not perfect. This thing I see come up sometimes when the topic of Teslas comes up, uh, either in the comments on our video on, tra on Transport Evolved, or in some other uh, discussion forums where I participate, there's a real reluctance among some people to talk about these cars as having things that aren't great. Um, and there's a real willingness among others. 
Some of that, I think, is that it can be very hard to tease out uh, in comments or in owner's forms, whatever, people who own and drive uh, and really like these cars and people who are invested in the company in other ways, primarily financially. Um, I think a lot of people who, who have a uh, real financial investment in the company may be a little less willing to discuss things that don't work well. But anyway, that's a side note. Let's talk about some of the issues we've had and some of the things about this car that aren't perfect. Um, first and foremost, the wipers are terrible. I shouldn't say that. The wipers are great, or fine, they're normal wipers. The wiper control is terrible. Um, the wipers are not controlled from uh, either of the stocks, like you might see in most cars. They're controlled through the screen. That's been changed recently to be relatively uh, quick and easy to get to, and have been issues and concerns over the years about accessing the wipers being too difficult. It's really not on this. Um, and I think that the reason Tesla has been sort of willing to have the wipers be buried a bit is that the idea is you just leave the car in auto for its wipers. And we've owned other cars with auto wipers where you just set them to auto and you forget about it. You can't do that in this car because auto wipers on this car just doesn't work. Um, I actually thought this was a problem with our car. Um, but no, it turns out it's a Model 3 thing, not a this Model 3 thing. Um, if you've got a good, steady, droning rain, the auto wipers are fine. Uh, if you've got light rain or mist, forget about it. If you've got snow, you're absolutely not going to get auto wipers working on this car. Um, their ability to sense is just terrible, and it doesn't use a traditional sort of rain sensing system you might see in some cars. It uses the cameras. Um, and in fairness, my BMW i3 had camera-based auto wipers that were also quite terrible. There isn't control over the inter intermittency. If you have, if you manually set them to intermittent, you can't like determine what that interval is. That would be a very easy software update that I just don't think we're going to get because Tesla would have to admit that the auto wipers are terrible. I'm told the auto wipers are a bit better now than they used to be, um, thanks to software updates, but they're still absolutely awful. So that's frustrating. Not the other world. You can manually get one wipe out of tapping the stock, um, or if you press harder, you get the, the wash. Um, and the, the wash function actually works pretty well in this car. The washers are built into the wiper arms. Other issues we've even encountered with this car. Um, well, both the front upper control arms had to be replaced within a couple of months of owning it. That was annoying. Covered under warranty, but they would not send a mobile service tech to our house, so I had to drive three states to go to a service centre and get it taken care of. That was annoying. The rear glass, which is quite a large piece of glass, since it's the rear portion of the roof and the whole rear window, um, experienced a massive stress fracture um, from the upper left corner all the way down to the bottom, all the way to the upper right corner. This big wavy crack. Fortunately, Tesla looked at it, um, determined that it was in fact a stress fracture and covered under warranty. And the actually, the new rear glass is much better fit than the, uh, than the old glass. The old glass was not perfectly aligned when you looked at it in sort of the, the roof rails. And it, it's better now. The fit and finish on the car is not the best. That's not a secret. For starters, the paint on this car is about as as tough as dollar store toilet paper. It's terrible. And um, actually all around the front door handles is all scratched from people reaching in to actuate the door handles. There's a lot of uh, orange peel in the paint finish. Um, the finish is, is not good and it's very, very fragile. Um, I'm told Tesla has really upped its game on paint, um, but I'm just talking about this car. The biggest thing to me is that uh, the trim doesn't align. Uh, we bought this car much, much, much cheaper than it was new. Uh, but if I bought a car for, new for 55 grand and the chrome on the doors didn't line up, I would be really, really annoyed. It annoys me on this car, but not the way it would have if I bought this car for brand new for full price. Um, the interior has actually held up pretty well. 
Um, the previous owner's dog sort of stained some of the rear um, sea pillar fabric with its nose and that didn't come clean. Um, but the interiors held up pretty well. The exterior, yeah, the panel gaps are, are not good. The trim alignment isn't good. So I mean, those, those are all issues. I don't like that if I'm in a fender bender, I have to take it to a service center to get fixed because Tesla won't sell body parts. That's really a concern for me, um, having been in fender benders. But on the balance for what we paid for the car, we're satisfied with the build quality. For what the car sold for new, I think it's kind of embarrassing. Another thing that's worth mentioning, the car has this beautiful glass roof um, and it gets really, really hot in the car. Living in Maine and we're gonna be living in Oregon, the glass is fine. Uh, I think if I lived in Arizona, I would absolutely buy a shade for it. And I still think it would get really, really hot in here. So we did do a couple of things to customize the car. Um, one of the very first things we did was add an inductive charging pad to the car. Um, we bought one from Jetta that we've been extremely happy with. It can charge two phones at once um, and does a really nice job. It's not something you'd have to think about in a new one because the new ones I believe have now added inductive charging pads, but this one didn't have it. And it was a feature we were very happy to add. We also added a USB hub um, that sort of fits in and looks very stock in a way that I like, also from Jetta actually. Um, and uh, that also has a compartment for the USB stick we use for Sentry mode. Uh, that was really nice. The, perhaps the nicest thing we've done was actually really recently, we installed a matte screen protector, a matte glass screen protector over the center screen. Um, we got that from Abstract Ocean and we've been extremely happy with it. Um, the center screen can definitely get pretty glary and you touch it a lot. Everything goes through the center screen. The matte screen protector doesn't show fingerprints nearly as much. And we're very conscious of the fact that we want to have this car for a long time. And um, the screen protector is an important thing for preserving the life of this, you know, hub from which everything in the car happens. The last modification we made that's worth mentioning is that we swapped out the Tesla branded all season floor mats the car came with for a set from 3D Max Spider, which we found to be better quality and to have better coverage of the pedal box in the driver's side footwell. So, what do I think about a Tesla Model 3 as a used car? I think it can be a really good option, but I've got a few caveats. First off, notice that we didn't buy ours from Tesla. Um, you pay, I think, quite a bit for a used Model 3 from Tesla. Now, that's not a Tesla criticism. You pay more for used cars from the manufacturer a lot of the time. I think there's some very good deals out there, but you have to be really careful. So for instance, this car, when it was bought, had lifetime connectivity. Um, the previous owner never paid a dime to have full connectivity service on the car um, in terms of, you know, like, like the way my husband uses Spotify. That didn't travel with the car. We have to pay for connectivity. Oftentimes, people who are buying cars that had full self-driving purchased for them find that they do not get full self-driving when they buy the car, particularly if they're not buying the car from Tesla. Um, so you have to be really sort of conscious about what you're getting. Do I think that's a Tesla thing? Right now it sort of is, but I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that moving forward, where people are paying money to unlock features that are built into their cars and those unlocked features may not travel when those cars are sold and you'd have people looking to pay to unlock those features when they buy the car used. Um, I think Tesla is missing a big opportunity by not having full self-driving be attached to an owner instead of a vehicle. If someone could buy full self-driving and know that when they bought their next Tesla, full self-driving would come with them rather than with the car. I think that would really incentivize people towards brand loyalty. Um, but yeah, it's something you need to be aware of. Um, I also don't know that I would have been comfortable buying this car if there was no warranty left. We're not gonna get rid of the car when the warranty expires. 
um, which is what we did do on our BMW i3, um, because that was a reliability nightmare. Um, we'll keep this car when the warranty expires. But I, I liked when we that when we got into it, we had that sort of added cushion of having some manufacturer warranty while we sort of shook out what issues there were or weren't with the car. There are much cheaper, very very good used EVs on the market right now. Um, you know, we paid half what we paid for this car used to buy my 2017 Chevy Bolt EV Premier Edition. Um, and other than the charging rate uh, and autopilot, there's a lot about the cars which are similar. Um, this car's much better range. Um, actually, not much better. This car's a significantly better range. Um, this car's a little more performance oriented, though you put the Bolt in sport mode and it is actually quite a bit of fun and it, it actually corners really nicely. The Bolt, I feel like, is a very, if money is an issue, the Bolt's a very good place to be. Um, I think when Koners finally get their battery replacement, Koners will be a very good place to be. To me, a used Model 3 is a really good option if you're seriously considering a new EV. Um, you know, we paid just about um, 35,500 for this car, which is not cheap at all. But there's nothing that I see coming to the market right now that I look at for my personal needs and say, eh, I'd rather spend an extra 10 or 15 and do that versus a used Model 3. And I think that Model 3 prices are gonna, gonna keep going down um, eventually. I think it's, it's a very good option. So yeah, I think if you're looking for a used EV and you can make your budget stretch to, to one of these, I think they are absolutely worth a look. So that's it for today. As always, thanks to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month Patreon supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month Patreons, Anonymous Freak, Regine Fellows, Gordon C., Paul Conway, Laura Sanborn, Anthony Coates, Denny Hyde, Sean Ueda, and Tesla Nagong. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, John Lyons, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fegerback, Will Grayland, and Ian. If you'd like to join the ranks of our wonderful supporters, you'll find links below to our Patreon, Bitcoin, and Kofi. You can always chat with the team and other Transport Evolve fans over at Discord. And if you'd like to buy some Transport Evolve swag, just head over to our Redbubble store. You also will find links below to our new Transport Evolve Shorts channel, where you can see our 60 second daily bits of news that you might want to see. So, as always, thanks for joining me and keep evolving! <laughs> <laughs>